you do me honor by inviting me to this very big, grand uh, event. Um, she called me a management guru. Let me quickly tell you what that means. It's good at understanding, G-U, but relatively useless, R-U. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course the word guru is also in my name, so that presents a problem. Uh, but it wasn't always so. Until the age of three, my name was actually Ashok Kumar. But my grandmother suspected that my mother, her daughter-in-law, had given me that name because she thought that my mother was secretly in love with a Bollywood actor named Ashok Kumar. <laughs> so she took me to her guru, placed me at his feet, and told the guru to give this boy a name. And so he looked down at me and he smiled and he said, well, since you have placed him there, we'll call him Guru Charan Das. So overnight, I was, so overnight, I was transformed from the prince of happiness, Ashok Kumar, to the humble servant of the feet of the guru. Anyway, we're going to talk today about the difference between making a living and making a life. We all want to be happy and we want to lead a rich, flourishing life. My own one sentence definition of happiness is to love, happiness is to love the work you do and love the person you live with. Now, Esther has asked me to talk about the first part. <laughs> For learning about how to love the person you live with, go and buy my book, Kama, the Riddle of Desire. And so I've done my job of giving to the penguin for giving this commercial. <laughs> the, in, when it comes to a flourishing life, I've learned in the many years that I've been doing research on the classical texts that really the best definition came from our ancient sources which was the idea of the Purusharthas, the goals of life. And so, Artha, Dharma, Kama, Moksha. And these were, as it were, potentialities in us as human beings. And they were, if fulfilled, they would lead to a flourishing life. It's somewhat like the, what Aristotle also talked about as capabilities of human beings or Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you may be familiar with. So I'm going to illustrate to you by two stories. One is my story and the other, and, and illustrate this business of making a living and making a life. And the other is that of an assistant security guard that I hired for in Procter and Gamble, who taught me everything I learned about business. Now, <clears throat> I grew up in a middle class family, and my earliest memory is that of when I was in kindergarten. I came home one day flashing a report card to my mother and she asked, did you come first? Well, you know this is the wrong question that she asked. 
what she should have asked is, are you enjoying school? And what do you enjoy doing in school? And so really, this question about, you see, we are not, unfortunately, we are not like Mozart, the music composer, who at the age of three knew that he was a musical genius. And it was because his father and mother had asked the right question in kindergarten that they discovered that this fellow was going to be a musical genius and they spent the rest of their lives uncovering this musical genius. Now, wouldn't we all like our parents to have done that? Well, it's also not just parents, our teachers, HR managers in companies. This is your role too to find out what is the special talent of a human being. Anyway, in, like many of you in a middle class family, I was told to work hard, to study, to get good marks so that I could get into a good college. When I got into a good college, I was taught, I was told to take useful subjects safe subjects so I could max, max in the exams and uh, then when I finished college I did reasonably well so I got a reasonably good job and, 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 and then started climbing ladders. I got married, uh, we had children and we, that began the hard work of bringing up children. So. <clears throat> And then when the, we repeated the same formula of our parents with our children. Until one day, in my, in, when I was in my, in my 40s, that I was sitting in the office. By then I was managing director Procter & Gamble worldwide in charge of global strategic planning. And I was poring over the market shares of VIX and Pampers and Tide and Ariel and Whisper, Pantene Shampoo, Gillette Blades, all good products. And I looked out the window and I said to myself, is this what life is all about? So I came home very unhappy. I told my wife that I felt life had passed me by while I was climbing ladders at work, while we were bringing up children. And she said, Chuck, you're just having a midlife crisis. It will pass. It will pass. But you know it did not pass. I. I went into a kind of depression and so my wife recognized that something really was wrong and so I told her, I think I want to quit and she said, are you crazy? Just when we've begun to earn big money at headquarters, you are amongst the top five people in this company, you want to quit? And retirement age is 65 and you're not even 50. So I tried to explain to her that we had enough savings. Now if she was, if she was, uh, if, if, if she didn't crave to have a standard of living go up, we could still manage with what we had. We had a home, our kids were grown up, so the college fees were paid. And so I said that let's go back. And, uh, <clears throat> So she was a good sport and so we came back. Now I must tell you that, I must tell you something that I 
when I went to college, I disobeyed my parents. Instead of taking useful subjects like engineering and business and all, I did liberal arts. Now the wonderful thing about doing liberal arts in a university in America is that you get a chance to, your whole world is open before you. In one semester you can take Greek tragedy, another one you're taking Russian history, you're taking Greeks, uh, Chinese ceramics in the third course, you're doing economics, you're doing uh, you can really take anything and they don't expect you to concentrate on any subject until your junior year. And that was the, for me the beginning of making a life. And essentially what it entails is to read the great books. And in fact if you go home and Google great books program hundred books will pop up and if you just read those hundred books in your lifetime or as HR managers you get the people around you to read those you'll find that you have the, a lot of the answers to making a life so when I finished college um, because I was not wealthy, I was middle class, I had got a scholarship to go to college, so I had to work. But I did the next best thing, which was that over the weekends I continued my hundred books reading and soon I realized that you don't just take in from books you interrogate a book, you question a text and then you write down and I found that when I wrote things down it got into my head much easier and I could also talk about interrogation meaning that I didn't agree with the author on, on this and to Marx particularly I had a lot of trouble with Marx although there were great insights in Marx. Anyway what I'm trying to say is that in my, my friends played golf over the weekends and I read and I wrote. And so it was a process of, in a way, making a living five days a week, making a life two days a week. And then, but I was lucky, I wrote three plays in my twenties. The play, one of them won a big prize, another one was done off-Broadway in New York, another one was done on BBC television as well as at the Edinburgh Festival. So, I mean, here Bombay, we are in Bombay. So Alec Padamsi did one, or, uh, directed one of my plays and, and, and so I had a bit of success. And with success, confidence. And then I wrote a novel in my 30s. And, and, and so more confidence. So by the time I quit PNG at 50, I had confidence that I wanted to be a writer. And uh, so began my second half of, second part of my life. I would worked for 20, 30 years and now I've worked almost 25 years as a writer. And, and so, two hats, making a living, making a life. And it was a quite an easy flow to go from one to the other because I had taken my hobby seriously. And, and so, this is sort of, I'm giving my life as an example because, as I said, your job as HR managers is to look after not only the uh, physical needs of your manager, of, of people in the company, but also their mental, emotional, spiritual needs of people. Um, 
and that's the whole idea of artha. Artha is the material needs. Then there's dharma, kama, moksha. These are all moral needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs. And so I think that we all want our we, we, there, there, there is hopefully a, some kind of lesson here. But very quickly now, I want to shift to my second story. The assistant security guard who came from a cola, metric pass, no, didn't speak English, and came to join us at Procter & Gamble when I was the head of the company. And I saw him within, he started working the night shift. And suddenly I found that people started staying late, later and later in the evening. And I asked them why. They said because of Kamle. Kamle was the security guard. Kamle, you want to, you're staying late? Well, he had created an atmosphere within by his sheer personality, by his curiosity, by the sort of uh, energy that he radiated. And let me explain to you why. First he quickly learned, I mean he's a, a villager, Kola is a town, but he was a Gawa. <laughs> and he, in fact, was such a Dehati that he could not pronounce the name of the company. He would say Procter and Gamble. <laughs> and, but, you know, he had that childlike curiosity. He had that childlike curiosity to learn everything. And so, the first day he learned how to make tea and coffee for people. Then next day, he didn't know English, but he started working on the telex machine, trying to see. Those days we sent telexes, and he started working on the telex. Then he found out how the telephone operator's system works, you know, the EPBX system. So he became the telephone operator. Then because we did a lot of advertising, you had, you had to run a projector. In those days, you showed commercials on projectors. So he knew how to do that. And essentially, after 5.30 in the evening, if you wanted anything, you said, ask Kamle. And you had, if you want, one day I needed to contact the finance director. Kamle said he's in Delhi, staying at Ashoka Hotel. This is the number. And he connected me to him. That was the kind of attention to detail, to service, and <clears throat> what, so I'll tell you, continue the story, that Kamle, after six months of doing the night shift, said that our telephone operator was going on maternity leave, the daytime operator. So he went to the HR manager, somebody like you, and he said, Bhai, main thak gaya hon, raat ko kaam karke. So give me a daytime. Give, let me be your temporary telephone operator until she comes back. And the HR manager said, Kamble, are you crazy? You can't even pronounce the name of our company. And we get calls from around the world. We are a multinational company. How can you be our telephone operator? So, Bichara, Kamble, with a long face, went away. But I heard through the grapevine what Kamle wanted. So I told the HR guy, because I'd seen what this guy had done in the evening. So I said, give him a chance. Let's try him out for a few days. If it doesn't work out, we'll get on somebody else. And sure enough, Kamle started working. And within two days, I get a call from my lawyers, Crawford Bailey. <clears throat> and they say, you know, the partner says, Mr. Das, is, do you have a new EPBX system? You, because your phone is always answered on the second ring. 
before I used to have to wait fifth ring, sixth ring. So I went to Kamle. I said, Kamle, why do you answer the phone so quickly? And he said, because there may be a customer on the other side. Best answer you could give. No, no, M <laughs> no MBA would have given or even our finance director would have given such a good answer. Anyway, so Kamle did exactly the same thing that he did in the evening shift. He energized the whole office. He started, he, while he was doing telephone operating, he was also uh, helping somebody with uh, make, you know, make Xerox copies or uh, telexes. He was, what he had done, I realized, was that he loved his work and he treated his work as though it was play. You know, it was like a child who plays. You know how people walk to, when it's raining with umbrellas, we go around walking and then there's a puddle of water and everybody goes around the puddle, right? A child will come and jump right into the puddle. Well, Kamle was this child. And really, you have to go back to the idea, child's play is also the word is God's play, Leela. The word Leela, Bhagavan ki Leela, Krishna Leela, Ram Leela, you know the stories. And the whole idea was that the gods created the universe for fun. They have no purpose. I mean, they have nothing to gain. They just created it. So, what I'm trying to say here is that there was something infectious in Kamle and he had a basic, a basic attitude which was an attitude of service. That my job is to give service. And you know, there are only three ways to create competitive advantage. You can create competitive advantage through superior, through superior products or lower prices or superior service. The lower prices cost the company money, uh, superior products cost a lot in R&D, but service is free. So fill your company with Kamblais is an HR manager's dream. And so my point is, that this is a mistake we make, all of us, that we hire people for skills and their degrees that they have got and for their intelligence. But whereas we should be hiring them for attitude. And we can always train people in skills. But you cannot change attitudes. And so this is really the critical thing that Kamble in a way represented that idea where at his job he not only was making a living but he was making a life. Now that, that, that is something that we all wish. We want people to love their work, they get fulfilled from their work, and not just treated as making a living. The way to tell that somebody is making a life at work, that person, for that person, time gets distorted. Meaning, the person says, oh my God, it's already eight o'clock. I forgot to have lunch, you know? We know people like that. You get so absorbed that they, their time gets distorted. Secondly, athletes behave like this. When Tendulkar was approaching his double century, you know, reporter asked, well, how did it feel? Uh, how did it feel when you were approaching your double century? And such, uh, Sachin said that I wasn't there, so how can I answer your question? 
the ball had become so big and the bat had become so big that the bat had to hit the ball and I wasn't even there. So there's an element of self-forgetting. In other words, you're not thinking of your next promotion when you're doing your work. You're being led by the passion of your work. And that's what Kamble, that he had that childish passion, the curiosity that, that, that one feels. And really this is also in a way the lesson that Krishna gave to Arjuna on the battlefield when he talked about Nishkam Karma, that act for the sake of the work and not for your personal reward. That is, a person's work will be good if he doesn't or she doesn't care who gets the credit. Now, it's not easy, but I know all HR managers would love to have employees with Nishkam Karma. So, listen, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've overstayed my time and, and, and uh, uh, just remember, if you want to think about this further, ask yourself, play a thought game with your friends. And the thought game is, what if the doctor told you you have three months to live? What will, how will you spend those three months? Because how you spend those three months is how you should spend your life. And frankly, making a li life is not about finding yourself. It's about creating yourself. And we can all create ourselves at any time in our, in our life. So, with that note, I know I have uh, uh, run slightly over and I ask uh, Esther's forgiveness for that. So thank you very much.